All right, take your Bibles and open up to Ephesians chapter 6. And for just a few minutes tonight, I want to talk with you about what we began talking about last week, and that is another piece of the armor, and that is the, the gospel shoes, which is, he, Paul says, is the peace of God, the gospel of peace that brings peace to our soul that enables us uh, to stand in battle. And so I want us to read the passage. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I want us to read the passage as we have done each of these messages uh, that starts in verse 10. And what we've been doing is we've added a piece of armor. We've added uh, uh, the part of the passage that includes that. And so uh, join me as we uh, uh, look at verse 10 in Ephesians 6 and following. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, his strategy, his plots. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And that is our mistake if we fall into the trap of believing, you see, our, our wrestling match, our war is with flesh and blood. He says, we don't wrestle with, against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Look this way for just a second. Paul makes clear in that statement that the real war that's going on is a war you can't see with your physical eyes. That's what he just said. So a lot of, uh, of what it manifests itself in our lives, a lot of the conflicts, a lot of the uh, the dilemmas and a lot of the, uh, the outward circumstances of our life must be attached to the unseen war that's going on, all right? And where we fall victim sometimes is we just look at everything as just the surface. This is just this happened and this. But Paul is telling us that the battle is going on uh, in the realm that you can't see. And so if we're going to be vigilant uh, uh, warriors for God, We've got to understand that much of the stuff that manifests itself uh, in our physical life is a part of a bigger battle going on. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying to us there. So never, never, ever forget that the battle that you face in your physical life is often tied directly to a battle that is going on in the heavenlies. He, these uh, princes and authorities, these cosmic powers, uh, these spiritual forces, you can't see them, but they're always active. All right, look on verse 13. Therefore, take a, therefore because that's true, uh, therefore take up the, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore. In other words, if you've done everything, you've taken on the armor, and he says, then Stand. Having fastened on the belt plate of truth, we talked about that. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, we talked about that. And last week we began talking about verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Father, uh, would you uh, enlighten our hearts, uh, instruct our minds, uh, fill our souls, and equip us. Uh, Father, uh, help us understand the battle and the armor that you have provided. Uh, from your word, um, God, counsel us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, you may recall, as we began talking about this, the gospel of peace, he compares that to the shoes that you wear, the, 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 what you put on your feet, and that makes a very, very important uh, a difference in the battle. Uh, because as we said last week, boots, one of the reasons soldiers wear boots in battle is so they, they can march effectively. Uh, in other words, so they can get where they need to go. And if you're going to go forward, you've got to have uh, the right kind of equipment, the right kind of shoes. We talked about that last week. I'm not going to spend uh, a chunk of time there, but you can go back and listen to that message. But here's a second thing I want to tell you tonight about the, the shoes of the gospel, the gospel of peace, and that is, or the boots, it would be a more appropriate understanding here, uh, because that's what the, the analogy that Paul is using is that of a Roman soldier. And and uh, so their boots were designed to help the soldier uh, move forward. But secondly, the boots enable the soldier to maintain their position during the battle. They, they help us hold our ground during the battle. 
The peace of God. Now remember, equate the boots with the peace of God, the gospel of peace. So you get saved, and guess what? Your soul finds peace, uh, not as the world gives, but a spiritual kind of peace that comes through your relationship with God. So you have this inner peace uh, for your soul, and that peace enables you to stand. Uh, we talked about, we were talking about being thankful. Several of you said through difficulties or through storms and that sort of stuff. Why? Not because the storms aren't real, not because the battle doesn't rage against your life, but the gospel of peace helps us to stand in the storm because we know our, uh, our eternity is secure. No matter what storm may come, no matter what battle we may face, we know that uh, the gospel of peace has uh, given us a sure and certain future. And so even when things are collapsing around us, uh, we can be assured of our eternal security, that the gospel has secured our, our soul. Uh, one of the great uh, Jewish historians, Josephus, uh, is, is probably the most thorough Jewish historian we have. And uh, in fact, I have the works of Josephus in my library. Uh, and it's a very common resource when you want to know, really in particular, the Roman Empire from the Jewish perspective and Jewish history, when you want to look at the first century and what was going on. And Josephus described the boots that were worn by Roman uh, soldiers, if you were part of the, one of the Roman legions. And he said, uh, in effect, that the shoes were these thickly studded, uh, the bottoms of them were thickly studded with sharp nails. And uh, we would call those today cleats, you know. But, uh, and they also, they came up above the shins here, all right? Just like modern day boots, they come up high to protect us, uh, protect that, that shin part. You know, if you're, uh, um, I went on a pheasant hunt a few, uh, a few months ago. Brother Tim and I went on a pheasant hunt. And uh, I realized I didn't have any really good shoes to tromp around through the woods in. And it's not ideal to put on a pair of tennis shoes and go pheasant hunting. And so I realized I need to go buy me a pair of boots. I went out and uh, looked around for boots and found me a, a pair of boots that I could just, without worry, walk through brush, thick brush, and all that sort of thing and not have to worry. And I bought some pair. They, I, my, my jeans went over them, but the boots really came up pretty high on the inside. And they were leather, and they were thick, and I'll wear them again uh, uh, when I, when I, the next time I hunt, probably in 10 years. And um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm going again here, not to distant future. But, but at any rate, uh, you could drop through the brush. And here was, it was amazing because I realized how much confidence I had. I, I wasn't worried too much about what I was stepping on or where I was walking. And you know, the boots protect you, not just the bottom, but it protects your, your shins too, you know, from little slimy, slithery things that run around, that can, can strike, come up, and, and, and that sort of But it, it reminded me again of how important it is to have good shoes on your feet. Well, the, the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, wore these kind of shoes uh, uh, which uh, had these spikes in the, the bottom of them. Well, you know what the spikes were for, right? I mean, it's to help them stand their ground. It's to help them to be stabilized. It's to help them maintain their position. You know, athletes wear cleats, uh, um, they wear uh, um, uh, track and field guys wear spikes. Have you ever seen the track and field spikes? I mean, they're pretty, pretty sharp, again, designed to, to dig in. They use different kinds of technology has changed today, and so they're different kinds depending on what kind of surface they're running on. And then, of course, golfers wear what we call golf uh, spikes. Nowadays, a lot of them are what we call soft cleats that they wear, but it's very important and uh, I play golf from time to time, and, and what I've noticed is if I don't have my spikes on, the few times that I've played and had to wear something other than golf cleats or soft cleats, uh, if you've ever forgot your shoes and had to wear tennis shoes, you do lose something in your swing because your feet will not be, they won't stay uh, in the same place. You'll slip and it affects your shot and all of that. Well, uh, the spikes are important. They're important in athlet, uh, athletics. Uh, and they're important in battle. And if you notice, if you look at uh, a pair of modern military boots, you'll notice they're grooved in the bottom and they're designed to help. And depending on what a particular uh, battalion might be facing, they'll wear different kinds of boots. Why? For stability. So they can hold their position. Because if you can't hold your ground, you become very vulnerable to the enemy. Do you know what the gospel of peace does for you? 
It helps you hold your ground. You know, when your world's being rocked, when things aren't going the way that you, you had hoped they would go, when you don't understand or you're not sure if you can make it through the battle, you know what the gospel of peace does? It helps you stand your ground. It helps you hold your position with God. That doesn't mean you can lose it with God, but it helps you to stay there so when the devil launches his, you're stable and you're, you're not slipping and falling, falling away or slipping back or retreating. And so these boots, these uh, shoes that the, the soldiers wore were, were designed to help them grip uh, the ground. Uh, several uh, years ago, I watched a, uh, a documentary. I, I don't know why I've had this intrigue with uh, Mount Everest, the highest peak, 29,000 feet, 29,000 feet, 29 feet, I think is what it is. It's changing, by the way. Uh, it always has been. Uh, but uh, I don't know why I've been intrigued. I've read a lot of books about uh, uh, groups that have ascended um, uh, Mount Everest and some fascinating stories about how many people die each year, how many people are literally buried on the mountain as you ascend the South Coal and different places along that uh, upward uh, peak and how they get there and all this amazing going across these, these uh, glaciers and uh, uh, what would appear to be thousand foot drops and how they, they do all that. Uh, and I've watched some documentaries on it. I've read a number of books about it. My wife has asked me on a couple of occasions, do you want to go do that? Do you want to actually climb Mount Everest? I said, not on your life. I think these people are crazy people uh, that do it. But I am intrigued by the whole process and how they get there. And it takes them weeks to, to summit, what they call summit. And then they can only be there for a short time. They have to get down immediately. They have to have supplemental oxygen to get there. All of these kinds of details to get to the top uh, of the mountain. But one thing, there's one essential that they all have to have. And uh, Sir Edmund Hillary was the first who climbed uh, Mount Everest. And, uh, and he had a, a rudimentary kind of this uh, device uh, that all of them, more modern climbers use today. It's called crampons. You know what a crampon is? It's a, it's a set of very sharp ice spikes that uh, attach to the shoe or the boot in this case. They wear winter boots and they attach these crampons onto those boots and literally you can climb up the side of a wall of ice with these things. They're that sharp. But they could not make it if they didn't have those crampons. And once you put them down in the ground, you're going to stay where you are until you pull your foot out of them, uh, out of that place and move to the next place. Now, if you can get that picture in mind, you'd have an idea of, of what the boot, the gospel of peace is designed to do. It is to help you stand in the onslaught of the enemy of your life. You know why? When he shoots his fiery uh, darts at you and his fiery arrows, here's what you know. Yes, you can attack me, but I am, I am secure in my relationship with God. There's nothing you can do to change my relationship with God. I have that kind of peace in the midst of whatever is going on in my life. So the promises of the gospel bring the reassurances of God and the peace of God to both my mind and heart. And so when I feel like quitting, I'm under attack, I'm under assault, and I feel like giving up, I'm in the heat of the battle, when fear and anxiety overwhelm me, guess what? It is the gospel of peace that reminds me that I can stand. One of the worst things, you know, we can do is to try to go into battle with a great deal of fear and anxiety in our hearts. And that's because of fear and anxiety. As I talked a little bit about this morning, we'll do a couple of things that will keep us off balance. Fear keeps you off balance. And it keeps you from being decisive. And uh, so then, by the way, that's why I'm important. If you didn't get to hear the message this morning, I urge you to go back, listen to it online, find it that way. But fear uh, and anxiety are very, very uh, destabilizing uh, feelings when you're in a battle. So our confidence, as I said this morning, it, our confidence is not in the elimination of those things. Our confidence is in Christ in the midst of those kinds of things so that when the battle is raging, uh, we, can, we can stand uh, in Christ. And see, the peace of God ruling in our hearts uh, does some things for you. It enables you to, to hold your ground, as I said, and holding your ground does uh, three things. It gives you confidence. If I know you can't knock me off my place, I have confidence. When I was growing up, we used to play a game. I, I don't know if they still play this game called King of the Hill. Any of y'all ever grew up playing King of the Hill? 
And you know what the object of King of the Hill was. It's not a very complicated game, uh, game, is it? Somebody stands on top of a heap and everybody else tries to knock him off. And if you can stay there, but you know, if, if you played that game to, to stand there, you've got to kind of spread out and you've got to kind of position yourself so you can hold your place because everybody's coming after you. All right? King of the hill. And whoever can stay there the longest is considered king of the hill. <clears throat> and you know what? If you get pretty good at that, then you develop a lot of confidence. You know? Because uh, why? You figured out how to stand. Well, you know how you stand? You stand in the gospel of peace. And it enables you. It brings confidence to face whatever. Now, I didn't say it brings cockiness. <clears throat> I said it brings confidence. And there's a big difference. Uh, a cockiness the devil will use against you. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stand take heed, lest he fall. You see, cockiness is more like arrogance. A cockiness is more like pride. And the Bible teaches that God hates pride. In fact, God knocks the proud down. And so don't confuse the two. I, the enemy will, will convince you that, uh, that, that nothing can take you down. Get ready, because when you start thinking you're standing in your own ability and your own strength and kind of a cocky, arrogant approach. You just get ready because it's quite likely that, that you're going to get taken down. But when your confidence is in God, you're stable in that. And so whatever comes, you can hold your position. That's confidence. But I'll tell you what else the peace of God does in your soul. It gives you security. When the battle doesn't seem to be going our way, it helps you dig in. It helps you hold on. Because sometimes, quite frankly, in the battle, all you can do is hold on. Brethren, let us not lose heart or grow weary in well-doing. Because in time, we will reap. That's what Paul said. If we do not lose heart. Sometimes all you can do is just dig in. That's why the gospel of peace and the, the, the peace of God is the only thing you have to hold on to. I don't mean you feel this euphoria. That's not what I mean. But you have peace about eternity and the ultimate things of life because everything around you is collapsing. Everything around you is going uh, a belly up. And so you dig in. The gospel helps you dig in and say, and sometimes, sometimes that's all you can do is just dig in and hold on. The gospel of peace helps you do that. And then it gives you hope. It reminds you that something better is ahead. So persecution and death and pain and hard times can be faced with the knowledge that I am more than a conqueror. That's what Paul said. Paul said it in Romans 8. He said, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will separate? That's the, that's the question. Who will separate us from And implied in that question is what? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He says, will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He asked him, will those things separate us from the love of Christ? And by the way, he knew what he was talking about because he had already said he had experienced all of those things. He says, just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We're being considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all... Did you get that? We're, be putting, we're being put to death all day long. We're, we're being considered sheep for slaughter. And then listen to what he says behind that. He says, but in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Even if that be true, he said, we still are the victors. We, we conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an incredible statement. He said, what, what's going to separate us from God's love? What, he said, you know what he's saying? This is a declaration of peace of soul. He says, it doesn't matter what is thrown at us, even as far as death, we are conquerors. We're conquerors because in the big things, the issue has been settled. And so no matter what may come at us in this life, we're okay because we cannot be separated from the love of God. It's kind of uh, like what Christendom said uh, that I talked about this morning when uh, Eudoxia kept uh, isolating him and sending him, he said, he said, I'm not afraid of that. 
He said, there, I don't fear death. He said, I don't fear poverty. He said, I don't uh, crave wealth. He said, on and on and on. He said, there's nothing that I... He said, as long as I'm with God, I'm okay. Well, that's really what Paul is saying. Even in the face of the most severe battles, we are victorious. Uh, even though our lives may be, be at stake, Paul still says, we are victorious. Our eternity is safe. And the love of God is ours. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to shake your world. He wants to rock you. He wants to destabilize you. Listen to me. Your stability is found in one person, and that's Jesus Christ, his love for you. No matter what comes at you, you always remember, you always remember that the devil can never, no matter how many fiery darts he throws at you, he can never, ever, ever, ever separate you from the love of God. He can't do it. No matter what kind of battle he puts you through. So stand in those shoes. Remain stable. Then there's a, a third thing that I want you to see about the boots tonight, and then we're done. And that is, uh, uh, boots not only enable you to kind of uh, maneuver and, uh, and stand, um, they enable you to, uh, to adjust in the battle. Uh, the military successes of Alexander the Great. You know, Alexander the Great conquered what was called the then-known world. And we're told his successes were in large part due to his armies being uh, well shod and thus able to move and to adjust uh, on the terrain that they faced. In other words, they had better shoes than their enemy. I mean, that's what, that's what history tells us. They were able to, it gave them an advantage in battle because they had better, better boots. They had better shoes that they could wear in the midst of the battle. And so the boots that, that the soldier wears gives them an advantage. Agility, maneuverability uh, provide some incredible advantages. Our army spends literally millions of dollars in research studying the way that our armies can become lighter and more agile in warfare. And they do that from equipment all the way down to the uniforms that the soldiers in the field wear. Did you know that? I mean, literally, we're all, we always think about what are the new techno weapons and what are the new kinds of things that uh, our military is uh, developing. And there's some fascinating things, by the way. I just saw a new one last week that our military has developed. And uh, it is, uh, what, what is that thing called, Chuck? Did I show you that? What that, that thing is? It's a, it shoots out a wave of heat. And it can shoot it as far as like 700 yards away. And they showed them, they were testing one of our military bases to show the test, and it doesn't hurt a person, it doesn't kill a person, but you can't advance forward. And they put people and they let civilians go out there 700 yards away. That's a long way. And they would raise this thing up and they just press a button and it, it shoots this wave. You can't even see it, but, but if you're in the path of it, it will knock you back or knock you down. And people were turning, and, and they, put, they let their own military generals get out there and feel it. It was absolutely fascinating for a kind of weapon that can deter without destroying people. It is just incredible. Some of the stuff they're coming up with. But, you know, we always think, yeah, that's the latest innovation, and those are pretty neat things that they're doing. But, you know, they study even the wardrobe of soldiers now. They're always looking at ways to, to advance the the, the uniform that the soldier wears, again, from the boots all the way up or from all the way up to the boots, however you want to look at it, the materials, all of those things. Why? Because here's what we know. A soldier that's outfitted properly has an advantage over their enemy. Do y'all remember the American, you've read a little bit about the American Revolution, my favorite period of history, and I've read a great deal about the American Revolution. And uh, it is truly a miracle of God that we became an independent nation, given the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, weaponry our soldiers had. Fighting the, at that time, the world's greatest army, the British army was the world's greatest, most equipped, well-equipped uh, army. And uh, we, were, we were a bunch of farmers, really how it started out. We were a bunch of farmers, and everybody, uh, whatever they had to fight with, they, they fought with. We tried to make some improvements there along the way. 
uh, but you may remember, uh, at least if you uh, had basic history in uh, school, you remember there were battles like the Battle at Valley Forge and other places where our soldiers, uh, many of them didn't even have, their, their boots were worn out, their, their shoes were worn out literally, and they were barefooted. And many of them had to wrap their feet in, in just rags just to try to can you imagine having to fight a battle against an enemy that's uh, uh, well-equipped? Well, I tell you what, it testifies to the providence of God uh, that, we, that we are where we are, which is another message altogether. But my point is, uh, these soldiers fought on with that. But can you imagine how, how much easier their battle would have been and how, how much fewer would have been those who deserted us if they'd have just had the right kind of equipment. Well, we do have the right kind of equipment. Uh, God has given it to us. He's told us what it is, so we are to put it on and wear it our, ourselves. Because if we don't have the right kind of, of shoes, spiritual shoes on, we become easy prey to the enemy. Now, I just said that the shoes give us stability, right? But they also give us maneuverability. And here's why. Because if you're a wounded soldier, if you've been knocked off of your, your, your post, guess what? You become very vulnerable. You become easy prey to the enemy. A soldier that is limping is an easy target. And our enemy is so shrewd that if, he, uh, if, he, uh, if you can't maneuver, he's going to hit you repeatedly. And so, see, the gospel of peace helps us uh, to hold our ground, but it also helps us to maneuver uh, when we need to maneuver. Um, I have on a, a few occasions had the joy of uh, skeet shooting. I really enjoy that. That's just a lot of fun. And, uh, and I've discovered something uh, I, the last time I was shooting skeet, and that is I did not miss, there was a scenario in which I didn't miss one skeet. And that scenario was as long as they were on the ground, I could hit every one of them. I was 100% at the, at the clay pigeons laying on the ground. But I tell you, then they got nasty. They started slinging them up in the air and saying, now hit that one. You see, it's a little bit different, isn't it? When the, the targets are uh, up in the air. A moving target is difficult to hit, isn't it? And so there's a time when, when God calls us to maneuver. And so we, we maneuver because we're maneuvering at the instruction of God. We are secured by the peace of God. And so we become, instead of being an easy target to the enemy, we maneuver in the gospel with the gospel of peace uh, uh, in our hearts to direct us to the place that God has for us. A moving target is more difficult to hit. A Christian that's alive, a Christian that is growing, a Christian that is learning, uh, and obeying God and allowing God's peace to reign in their heart is, is moving uh, forward, and they're much harder for the enemy to hit. But a Christian who lives chaotically, a Christian that's stagnant, that's not growing, who, uh, who is not allowing God to control their lives, their decisions or, or their directions, they are like a, a wounded, a limping, a soldier, and they become an easy target for the enemy. So here's what I want to wrap up with. I want you to understand the importance of allowing the peace of God to rule in your hearts in order to stay strong, in order to be stable, in order to maneuver when God says it's time to move, um, when our battlefield is littered with problems and our bodies are, have been uh, uh, wounded from the shrapnel of the enemy and all kind of debris that's come into our life, then we are to find our stability, our security, and our maneuverability in the gospel of peace. Ruth Bell Graham told before she died, she told a story about her son Franklin. Y'all know who Franklin is, is, is now the head of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And she said one day Franklin was sleeping on the front porch with his cowboy boots and his toy gun. And she said, there was, the reason he was doing that is because we'd been having a problem with pole cats. Y'all know, in South Alabama, you know what a pole cat is, don't you? It's a skunk. And um, uh, by the way, I, uh, uh, our daughter and son-in-law, their home in Brentwood, Tennessee, have a park behind their house, and they've had skunks that keep coming into their yards at night. And uh, and so uh, Luke has set up a command post uh, from the second-story window. 
And uh, I'm not going to tell you what he's doing, but uh, at any rate, it, it pops and has a loud noise when he, uh, when he aims it. Uh, at skunks, but they've been trying to run the skunks off, and they come back and back, and they are walking through the neighborhood. Well, uh, uh, Ruth Bell Graham, living on top of that, said we were having problems with the pole cast, the skunks. And so Franklin decided to sleep out on the porch one night in his cowboy, in his cowboy boots and with his uh, toy gun. And she told him, she said, Franklin, she said, it's just a toy gun. To which Franklin replied, said, that's okay, mama. The pole cats don't know that. Well, listen, our battle is not play. And our weapons are not toys. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, meaning the enemy. Dear friend, do you understand that, that God has given you the kind of equipment that you need? Now, I'm not finished with this series. We've got several more pieces of the armor that are vital to your success in the battles. But what I would urge you to do is not stop at the boots, you see, because if you stop at the boots, you've only got half the armor on. And that only protects you a little bit. But there's enough armor to protect you fully. And when, when uh, the Scripture in this passage talks about the armor, Paul says put on the whole armor, not the partial armor of God. Put on the whole thing. So here's my challenge to you in the weeks that shall follow until we get back to this text, not to drop your guard. Number two, read on. If you haven't read this passage, read on. Maybe read it every week and get familiar with the rest of the armor because you need it all. Some of you know the mythological story of Achilles. Y'all know that story? Uh, Achilles' mom dipped him in the river to protect him. If she dipped him in the river, the river would form a barrier of protection on his life. And so she dipped him in the river, but the only place she didn't dip him was where she was holding him by the Achilles. And guess where the enemy struck him? In the Achilles. Well, you know what? The enemy will find the unprotected place. So that's why don't stop with just the boots. You need all of these. But there's more to the armor. And we'll get back to this in just a few weeks. But tonight, maybe you're here and you say, is the armor for everyone? No, it's not for everyone. It's only for those who belong to Christ. You say, well, I'd like to have the armor. Well, then you need to make sure you know Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to step down here, and I want to invite you to slip out balcony or ground floor and come and say, I need to know Christ. I want the armor for the battle. You see, you may not have even recognized that the battle for your soul is raging out there. If you don't know Christ, you say, well, would it affect me? I absolutely affect you. And you know what the devil wants to do to you? He wants to blind you so that you don't recognize your need for Christ. God wants the scales to drop from your eyes so that you can put your trust in the only one that can protect you, not just in this world, but can protect you eternally. And by the way, that's the world you need protection from ultimately. And so I invite you to come tonight, give your life to Christ. You may be here this evening and say, you know what, I need church home or church family. Come and do what others have already done today, and that is say, I want Ridgecrest to be my church home or my family. Would you slip out and come on? Maybe you want to come and pray around this altar. It's open for you. Or maybe there's another decision. Maybe God's calling you to the mission field. Maybe God says, you know, it's time for you to deal with your baptism. You need to be baptized. And so whatever that decision may be, will you listen to his voice? And when we begin on the first words of the hymn, of the invitation, would you slip out? Don't, don't wait and say, well, if somebody else goes, I'll go. You say, no, God, I know what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it tonight. Okay, are you ready? I want you to stand with me. I'm going to lead us in prayer. After that, Brother Tim is going to come. He's going to lead us. I'll be at the front, and I'll wait for you to slip out. Come on, whatever that decision may be. Father, thank you that you've given us all the armor we need to stand in the battle. Even when the battle rages, God, we can stand. You didn't tell us that you take us out of the battle. That's why you gave us armor, so we could uh, stand in the battle. And the shoes of the gospel bring peace to our soul that no matter what darts the enemy may throw to remind us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
Tonight, I pray, God, that you will speak to any hearts in this place that do not know you. They need armor, but most of all, they need salvation. And help them to realize that you love them and that your Son, our precious Savior, died on a cross for them. Help them to come and give their heart, their life to you tonight. For others in this place that need a home and need a place to belong to, let this be that place tonight where they come. Lord, we love you, and we pray that you would speak now to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, are you ready? You come on. I'll meet you down here. Come on right now. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you, Tim, and that's, thank you, Hugh, that's enough. Hey, before we go tonight, I, I want to ask you a question. I have a strong sense that there are some people here tonight, and you're in the midst of a war right now, a spiritual war, and you need prayer. Would you, would you let us know, are you, you're in a battle right now, and you need prayer, or you, you wouldn't be ashamed to say, I need some prayer. Yeah, 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 all, all over this place here, right? I'm, I'm in a war right now. Now, hold your hands up again. Thank you for doing that. Now, look, congregation, now listen, I'm not trying to embarrass any of you. I don't want you to tell us what that is. Don't need to know what that is. But the people that have their hands up, I want several, I'm going to lead us in prayer, but I want several of you to gather around them. All right? Gather around them. Just find them. Just find them. Don't be afraid to move. Okay, move. Y'all move. Find these people. And gather around them Let's, as a family. We're going to pray for these people right now. Just look, look around and find some people that are that and uh, that have held their hand up. And um, I, I want to pray for them tonight. And I want you around them praying for them too, okay? But uh, there, there are just some battles going on. And by the way, you ought to pray for them because if it, it's going to be you next time. See? And so is there anybody else you say, hey, I'm, I'm in that battle. If you're going to be praying for people, I, I want prayer tonight too. Anybody else that hasn't done that yet? Okay. All right. I want to lead us in prayer, okay? Now, Lord Jesus, uh, the battle rages, we know that uh, always, but sometimes it's very intense. And sometimes, uh, Father, um, we just don't know what to do. And so, Father, these that have raised their hands, whatever their battles may be, whatever the war they're going through right now, we know that, Father, it has some kind of spiritual connection somewhere, God. Would you give them strength? Father, would you make your presence known to them? Would you help them, God, in the battle to stand in the gospel of peace? Father, in Jesus' name, we bind the enemy. Father, you can bind a strong man. We can't, but you can. And so, Father, we ask that you would take him. He is ultimately a captive. We'll be cast into the lake of fire. We'll be uh, uh, held captive uh, ultimately forever. But right now, God, as he roams about like a roaring lion, we pray your protection over these, uh, your children, over all of us, Father, over this church. Father, as the battle rages, help us to keep our eyes on you. And never drop our guard. Wear the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace on our feet. Help us stand and help these stand. Help all of us to stand. Father, so that the enemy will not have any kind of victory. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God our Father. No matter what it is, no matter what the battle is, we thank you for that. We receive that promise. And for these, again, we pray they would know your strength, know your presence, 
And Father, the peace of the gospel, we pray, would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being